the music industry is just a microcosm of the world. So whenever you stand for something and you stand for goodness and truth, you will always get resistance. That's period. Whether you're in pharmaceutical, the pharmaceutical industry, you know, it's hard balancing and juggling. It's hard, you know, being, um, you know, uh, the regular person that you are one day and the next day being under public scrutiny, you know. So Lauren Hill is finally breaking her silence on how the industry tried to sacrifice her, which is what made her disappear from the spotlight. And let me tell y'all, you don't know the real definition of Holly Weird until you've heard the story of Lauren Hill. Lauren Hill was at the top of her game after she released the iconic album, The Miseducation of Lauren Hill. When we suddenly stopped seeing her in public, she dropped one of the most iconic albums of all time and then dipped. Many people believe this has to do with her getting exploited by the industry and the media and not getting protected by her crew members from the Fugees when she needed them. However, Lauren is now telling us that we don't even know the half of it because it goes way deeper than we know. But did the industry really try to sacrifice Lauren Hill? And were her Fugees members somehow involved in whatever happened to her? Let's break it down. So Lauren Hill is undoubtedly one of the most influential female hip-hop and R&B artists of all time. No, scratch that. She is one of the most influential artists of all time, period. At a very young age, Lauren was out here setting records that these new girlies are still struggling to catch up with. What set Lauren apart from other female MCs was not just her incredible talent, and she was really talented. Rolling Stone once described her as a quadruple threat because she was a rapper, world-class singer, songwriter, and producer. But the thing that really sealed Lauren spot in the greatest of all time conversation was the grace and plain swagger she showed in public and on stage. That and the fact that she laced her work with many political messages that felt like a break from the status quo. To give you a better understanding of Lauren's musical genius, let's take a quick trip down memory lane. Lauren Hill was born to parents Valerie Hill, a teacher, and Mal Hill, a computer and management consultant who raised her in South Orange, New Jersey. From a young age, Lauren was exposed to a lot of music because her parents loved music. Her mother played the piano and her father had a sweet voice, so much of her musical influence comes from the artists she listened to as a child, including Curtis Mayfield, Stevie Wonder, Aretha Franklin, Gladys Knight, and Marvin Gaye. All of this made Lauren fall in love with music, and she already knew she was going to be an entertainer from a young age. When she was 13, Lauren performed at Showtime at the Apollo, and the audience treated her roughly, booing her off stage. Although she still tried to finish her performance, she broke down in tears after the show. At the time, her mother, Valerie, told her straight up that if she was going to cry every time she didn't get the reaction she wanted from the crowd, then maybe show business wasn't for her after all. But as Valerie recalled, Lauren was totally not having that at all. She was determined to become a star. Well, Lauren would get her wish when, during her freshman year of high school, a mutual friend introduced her to Praz, who was looking for a vocalist to join a music group he was creating. Praz and Lauren, alongside a third female vocalist, started their musical journey under the name Translator Crew. After a while, the third member of the crew was replaced by Pross's cousin, Wyclef, and the band started performing at local shows and high school talent shows. Lauren also soon started rapping rather than just being the group's vocalist. As her music career was trying to find its footing, Lauren also launched her acting career. In 1991, she and Pross appeared in MC Light's off-Broadway hip-hop rendering of Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. It was while she was doing this gig that an agent noticed her and began plugging her into more acting roles. Later that year, Lauren began appearing on the soap opera as the world turns as troubled teen Kira Johnson. In 1993, she starred alongside Whoopi Goldberg in Sister Act 2, Back in the Habit, performing the songs His Eye is on the Sparrow and Joyful Joyful. In 1993, Pross, Lauren, and Wyclef renamed their group the Fugees, derived from the word refugees, which was a derogatory term for Haitian Americans. Around this time, Wyclef and Lauren started dating, although Wyclef had been feeling Lauren up for a while. What's crazy is there was a six-year gap between them, so when Lauren was 18, Wyclef was around 26. It would later come out that he had been messing around with Lauren for years before they finally took their relationship public. Wyclef allegedly started getting closer to Lauren under the guise of mentorship because he knew Pross would not be happy with him for trying to get with Lauren. I mean, Pross did say he literally took Lauren off her mother's hands when she was around 12, 13, and promised to look after her. But Wyclef allegedly started sneaking around with Lauren while keeping 
things on the low until she turned 18, and he finally felt safe enough to take things public. Meanwhile, in 1994, the Fugees released their first album, Blunted on Reality, which kind of flopped commercially and didn't get many favorable reviews from critics. However, it was still a shining moment for Lauren because her bars on the track Some Seek Stardom stood out to fans. By 1996, the Fugees had released their second album, The Score, which was miles better than their previous album. It peaked at number one on the Billboard 200 and stayed in the top 10 for over six months. It also sold over 20 million copies worldwide, winning the Fugees a Grammy for Best Rap Album. It was also later included on Rolling Stone's list of 500 greatest albums of all time. The album once again highlighted Lauren's musical talents, and her rendition of Charles Fox's Killing Me Softly became the group's breakout hit. Around this time, people began to pressure Lauren to leave the group and kickstart her solo career, but she remained fiercely loyal to them. In the summer of 1996, Lauren met Rohan Marley, Bob Marley's son, and started dating him as a ploy to get out of her relationship with Wyclef. Eventually, she got pregnant, and initially, everyone was confused about whether the child belonged to Rohan or Wyclef. But Lauren later made it clear that Rohan was the father of her baby, and like that, she and Wyclef broke up. In 1997, the Fugees split and started working on solo projects. However, to Lauren's surprise, Wyclef didn't show her any of the support she had been showing the Fugees all these years. Proz talked about this in an interview where he said, I remember when Pepsi wanted her for a commercial, and they were like, all we want is you, we don't need the other two cats. She said, without them, I'm not doing it. There's a lot of things she didn't do because of the group. Then, when she goes to work on her music and she doesn't have the support, that can have an effect mentally. She felt there was no support on that angle. When you feel the ones you stuck your neck out for ain't doing the same for you, it brings a certain animosity and bitterness. Anyway, Lauren released her debut album, The Miseducation of Lauren Hill, in 1998 to rave reviews from critics. What stood out the most about the album was how Lauren Hill blended different genres together, from R&B to doo-wop, pop, hip-hop, and reggae. In just one week, Miss Education sold 423,000 copies and would go on to sell 10 million copies in the US and 20 million worldwide. The album also received 10 Grammy nominations and won five, making Lauren the first woman to receive that many nominations and awards in one night. It goes without saying that Miss Education has been included in multiple best album lists, including Rolling Stone's 500 Greatest Albums of All Time. With all the records the album set, Lauryn Hill cemented her place as one of the greatest to ever do music. Now, you would think Lauren and her management would be quick to capitalize on the success of this album to push out more projects and get Lauren more deals, but her career just fell into a downward spiral from there. It started with getting hit with a lawsuit in 1998 by New Ark, claiming they wrote on many of the songs in Lauren's album but didn't get properly credited for it. At the time, Lauren's record label, Columbia Records, advised her to settle out of court. But Lauren felt like settling would be an admission of guilt, and she wanted to protect her name and credibility. Unfortunately, Lauren eventually had to reach a $5 million settlement, which greatly messed with her confidence. Her friends believed the reason why it hit her so hard was that she believed everyone she worked with was like family to her, and she tried to treat everyone fairly. But the fact that they turned around and sued her made her feel like she couldn't trust anyone. After that lawsuit, sources close to Lauren said she just lost interest in getting back in the business. In a 2003 article by Rolling Stone, it was revealed that Lauren turned down roles in movies like Charlie's Angels, The Born Identity, The Mexican, and The Matrix. Around this point, it seemed like the pressures of success were already getting to Lauren, and she started having mental health issues. Um, but it's hard, you know, it's hard balancing and juggling. It's hard, you know, being, um, you know, uh, the regular person that you are one day and the next day being under public scrutiny, you mm -hmm. know, having to live your life, you know, um, you know, in front of a camera, you know, it's not, it's not an easy thing. A friend told Rolling Stone, I think Lauren grew to despise who Lauren Hill was. Not that she despised herself as a human being, but she despised the manufactured international superstar magazine cover girl who wasn't able to go out of the house looking a little tattered on a given day. Lauren put a lot of pressure on herself after all that success, and then one day she said, F it. Lauren herself confirmed that she had been having mental health struggles in 2001 when she recorded her MTV Unplugged 2.0. Although the project flopped and didn't get many sales, the people who did listen to it claimed it painted a clearer picture of what Lauren must have been going through at the time. For example, at some point in the record, Lauren can be heard breaking down in tears, saying, I'm crazy and deranged. I'm emotionally unstable. I used to get dressed for y'all. I don't do that anymore. I used to be a performer, and I really don't consider myself a performer anymore. 
I had created this public persona, this public illusion, and it held me hostage. I couldn't be a real person because you're too afraid of what your public will say. At that point, I had to do some dying. At this, people started wondering how on earth Lauren went from the classy, savvy artist who released Miss Education to a struggling woman who could barely keep herself from breaking down in tears in the studio. Many people attributed Lauren's spiral to her toxic love life, particularly in her relationship with Wyclef, who later revealed that he felt the Fugees broke up because of his relationship with Lauren, which caused a lot of tension behind the scenes. That, and the fact that even after he got married to his wife, Claudinette, he was still sneaking around with Lauren. Obviously, Proz was not happy about the relationship, so that's one thing. But Wyclef also tried to make it seem like Lauren was the reason why their relationship was unstable. According to him, the relationship was toxic, and Lauren usually got physical with him when they had arguments. In his autobiography, Wyclef wrote, We had huge fights, and a few times when it went down, she started swinging at me right there in the seats. People would scatter. We never got arrested, but we came close a few times in Europe. It sounds like the fights used to be pretty intense for Wyclef to have been talking about them, possibly getting arrested. But what stood out to fans was that Wyclef didn't take any responsibility for the role he played in Lauren's downfall. He just blamed everything on her and tried to make her seem crazy. And what's that thing Dave Chappelle said about Hollywood painting people as crazy once they start to go against the status quo? They did it to Cat Williams when he called out the industry. They did it to Taryn Manning, they did it to Rose McGowan. Literally, the fastest way to get kick it out of the industry is to say something that the higher ups and gatekeepers don't like. And this brings us to another speculation people have made regarding Lauren that she was sacrificed by Hollywood. Allegedly, some higher ups in Hollywood did not like the political nature of her music and her speeches. And this made her a perfect target for so-called Holly weird sacrifices. The music industry is just a microcosm of the world. So whenever you stand for something and you stand for goodness and truth, you will always get resistance. That's period. Whether you're in pharmaceutical, the pharmaceutical industry, the record industry or whatever, whenever you stand for truth and for the service, you know, the service of others. See, I, I can make money very easily. I could make records that are self-indulgent and, you know, basically self-promote me. I could do that. I could do that. Promote myself. That was redundant, but you know what I mean. You know, just do those things. It's very easy. As a matter of fact, you know, lyrically as an MC, that stuff comes easy. But in order to promote something higher, I mean, I feel now at the ripe old age of 25 that the only thing that I could do is, is serve others. You understand what I'm saying? And, and because there are people who have not reached that point in their walk, you know, yes, there's a little anger, there's a little resentment because you, you raise a standard, you know, you, you, especially when you do it and, and you make some noise, you know, and you do it and, and people actually listen to what you have to say and like your record is bumping on the radio and you're saying something that holds a mirror up to a lot of the negativity and self-indulgent things and messages that a lot of other people, you know, but, but we're all young. Remember that time Lauren went on her infamous rant against the Catholic Church at the 2003 Christmas concert at the Vatican? Lauren took everyone by surprise during that performance when she said she only accepted the invitation so she could protest the child scandals that took place in the church. She blasted the church from the stage saying, I'm sorry if I am about to offend some of you. I did not accept my invitation to celebrate with you the birth of Christ. Instead, I ask you why you are not in mourning for him in this place. Then she went ahead to call the church leaders out on their corruption and exploitation of those under their leadership, screaming at them to repent. The rant went on for several minutes, and despite the backlash she received, Lauren stood by what she said. This made many people to believe Lauren was deranged, out of it, or on drugs. Allegedly, Lauren really stepped on many nerves with that little speech because her career got blackballed after that. I mean, it wasn't the first time they made a legendary artist lose their career and legacy for calling out the Catholic Church. Sinead O'Connor faced a similar backlash after she ripped the photo of the Pope to protest. Then, some people blamed it all on Lauren's increased closeness with Brother Anthony, a shady spiritual she met in 2001. Lauren's closest friends believed Brother Anthony brainwashed Lauren because after she started hanging around him, she stopped doing interviews, wearing makeup, or even appearing in public. She would attend meetings and Bible studies organized by Brother Anthony five times a week and didn't want to speak to any of her friends. Things got even crazier when she fired everyone on her team, a decision many people believed was influenced influenced by Brother Anthony. According to inside sources, Lauren's friends felt like Brother Anthony was taking advantage of Lauren's vulnerable situation. He encouraged her to give up her money, seclude herself, and basically cut off everyone from her life. 
However, in all this, some still believe that everything that happened to Lauren wouldn't have happened if the people closest to her had taken care of her when they should. In fact, it seems Lauren believes she was deliberately sacrificed by the people closest to her. In 2004, Lauren did an interview with Trace Magazine, where she gave her version of what really went down between her and Wyclef. In the interview, she suggested that Wyclef was aggressive and controlling and that he was the one who tried to manipulate her in the relationship. The Fugees was a conspiracy to control, to manipulate, and to encourage dependence. I took a lot of abuse that many people would not have taken in these circumstances. As a young woman, I saw the best in everyone, but I did not see the lust and insecurities of men. I discovered what a lie was and how lies manifested themselves. Praz also blamed Wyclef for everything that happened with Lauren and even for the eventual disbandment of the group. He said, he's the cancer of the Fugees. He's the cancer. You can quote me. He's the reason why it got wrecked to begin with. He's the reason why it's not fixed. When he was asked if he believed Wyclef was the reason for Lauren's troubles, he said, maybe, but not directly. It was clear he didn't want to spill everything on his mind, but you could still tell he was not happy with the things Wyclef did with Lauren. In 2021, Lauren did an interview for Rolling Stone's 500 Greatest Albums podcast, where she talked about how she had to step away from the spotlight to protect herself and her family from the dark and negative energy she was exposed to in the industry. I sacrificed the quality of my life to help people experience something that had been unreachable before then. When I saw people struggle to appreciate what that took, I had to pull back and make sure I and my family were safe and good. I'm still doing that. She then added that the celebrity is often treated like a sacrifice, the fatted calf, then boxed in and harshly judged for very normal and natural responses to abnormal circumstances. Many fans interpreted this to mean Lauren had seen some things in the industry that scared her into leaving the limelight and her fighting for her life. But now I want to know what y'all think about Lauren Hill's journey through the music industry. Do you think she was targeted by some higher ups or she just fell off? Leave a comment down below and we'll see you in the next video.